So this interview will be a little bit different what you have done so far today. And it's kind of focused mostly on your vocals. Okay, cool. We have a video series on our YouTube channel where I've interviewed like Randy from Lamp of God and Mille from Creator. And, and I just did like Tim with As I Lay Dying. And there's like several, several like musicians I've interviewed about their vocals. So are you ready to roll? Of course, yeah. So first question goes that what actually got you into like rock and metal music at first? Um, I suppose like most people, you know, it's just like a, a social thing. Like at my school, that's what my my friends were into. Um, I I I was first into like Brit pop, um, and like more sort of standard rock stuff. But then I discovered my local Dean, um, and there was lots of hardcore punk bands, um, metal bands, yeah, ska bands, um. And I think that's what truly grabbed me. I think, you know, especially like hardcore punk, there was something so visceral, so full of passion um, within that genre that, um, yeah, I just fell in love with it immediately. Um, yeah, and I suppose at the same time, I had my uncle, he, he was really into his dance music and he introduced me to The Prodigy, which is also kind of alternative. Um, so yeah, just kind of fell in love with that style of music when I was, I was much, much younger. So were there like some specific bands that you sort of like looked up to, a, up to as an influence back in the days? Um, yeah, all sorts. I mean, I was, I was, I became completely obsessed with our local bands. Um, we were, I was very lucky. I was very spoiled with, with so many great bands. Um, most of them didn't really do do much outside of the the uk or even outside of our kind of uh area of the uk the, the southeast um but i suppose there's bands like sixth um who uh who did some incredible stuff and were very influential yep. um and we went on to so dan weller the the songwriter and guitarist of sixth ended up producing some of our albums and he became a really good friend of ours um and then i suppose outside of the local scene uh yeah there were all sorts um i remember discovering you know obviously like you know big bands like raging against the machine um and a lot of like american hardcore bands uh refused um and then after that um i suppose like more um you know different like sub genres and things and yeah, just all sorts. So what made you become a vocalist and, and what made you form a band? Um, probably just through, well, uh, I started writing songs with Chris, who's our bassist. Uh, we've been like really good friends since we were kids. So we started writing just like silly dongs and mucking around when we were like 10 years old. Um, and then I became much more interested, like properly in songwriting. As I got older, you know, I got, I got a guitar um, and was writing. I remember one Christmas, I got a, a four track tape recording machine. Um, so I, I was a songwriter first and it was in bands with Chris and with, with other people. Um, and I liked singing, but I never really thought that I was like a front man um but i think after a while with playing in like rock bands i i really wanted to experiment and i got myself like synths and sequences and things and wanted to include more um like electronic influences and that's when i thought well i'm going to stop playing guitar and i'm just going to be like the singer and also do some synth stuff um but yeah it's just just really through the necessity, I suppose, you, normally when you're the songwriter, you end up singing the songs as well. So was Enter Sikari like your first proper band that you had, or were you in bands before Enter Sikari was formed? Um, before Rory, our guitarist, joined in 2003, and that's when we became Enter Sikari. Before that, we were a three-piece. So me, Rob and Chris were in... Um, yeah, with a band of very different forms. Sometimes we had we had other members as well. Um, but yeah, the 
the one just before Enter Shikari was called Hybrid. Um, we sort of sounded like a mixture of Muse and Radiohead with like extra all sorts of other influences like Scar influences as well. And yeah, it's kind of strange, progressive, progressive rock. But yeah, in 2003, that's when um, Shikari formed. So when you started playing with Shikari, were you like immediately making your own songs or, or were you like rehearsing some covers in the early days? And, and how did you sort of like become a, like a screaming slash like more harsh kind of vocalist? Mm. Yeah, well, I, I suppose the first bands I was in were cover bands, you know, uh, me, Chris and Rob used to play with two other guys and we would play like school fates and people's birthdays and we'd be covering Beatles and Oasis and Blur and things like that. Um, and then as I became more of a a songwriter, like a and, and sort of took myself seriously, um, then, yeah, just started writing my own stuff and playing more of my own. But by the time we were in the Shikari, yeah, it was just, I mean, it, we weren't playing covers by that point. It was just our own music. Um, and I suppose, yeah, I remember, I remember there was just a an excitement around alternative music because our five piece was still very Britpop and we were like about 12 at the time. And our local venue, when we went there, you know, we'd, we'd watch these hardcore punk bands and I'd be like, oh, I want to be more like that. I'm, I'm kind of bored of, of Britpop now. Um, and I remember the other two guys that we were with in the band weren't really interested. I think they were a bit like scared of that scene. Um, you know, a lot of people thought it was just, especially that this venue in our local town, people thought it was just like drugs and fights and things like that. But um, actually I think it was quite a positive thing because it got, It got kids off the street, you know, it gave them like a, a community, it gave them something like solid um, and a sense of belonging. Um, and so, yeah, we just felt really allured by that and really um, excited by that whole scene. Yeah. And so just because that was the music we were beginning to listen to, we tried to replicate it at first. So, you know, we we went through a stage when we just we just sounded like a, a normal, you know, very average hardcore punk band. Um And then, yeah, as I say, then we started to, to experiment with synths. And I think I, after a while, I realized that I could never just be like in a hardcore band because I like melody too much. Melody is so important to me. I, I grew up with Motown and Northern Soul and, and obviously the Beatles and stuff like that. So, yeah, I realized that actually it was what I was most interested in is was making music that was a a collection of different influences um, and had all of these aspects to it. So how did you learn to scream then? Was it like, were you like first like mimicking your favorite vocalist and then sort of like figuring out your own way to do things or or how did that actually happen for you? Yeah, it was just, uh, yeah, just a bit of mimicking, a bit of trial and error. You know, I Even when we were recording our first album, I was still didn't really know what I was doing. I never had any lessons. Um, so during recording Take to the Skies, I actually had vocal, I had nodules on my vocal cords, which yeah. is um, quite a dangerous thing. Um, and so that's why that album, my vocals, I just, I can't really listen to it because I just hear pain. <laughs> um, oh, okay. I was actually just listening to it like before this uh, interview and it still sounds okay. like amazing to my oh, ears. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, well, it's, it's um, yeah, it's def it definitely had a a vibe to it. But um, yeah, I, I just eventually, as the years went by and, you know, we did, we toured so much. So I sort of learned what aspects um, of, of what techniques would damage my voice and what techniques would be okay. Um, and, you know, I'm still learning things today, um, but it's, I, I like experimenting. I like finding out for myself, you know, I like the process of failing and then building on what you learn and progressing. So what kind of memories do you have when it comes to like the first proper European tour you did? Were you sort of ready as a vocalist back then or was it like a massive learning experience? Did you have the stamina to do like show after show after show? Um. No, I think I mean back then I'm sure I did a lot of the a lot of the shows just running at like 50%, you know, because I was I was probably drinking a lot. 
I was probably, my throat was probably dehydrated. Um, so, it, you know, I'm sure that the, the shows weren't half as good as, as how they are now, where I take, take things a lot more seriously. Um, yeah, but I remember that some of those early tours, we were so lucky, you know, we got to play, we got to support Lincoln Park um, in a European ar arena tour. We got to support Prodigy. Uh, Billy Talent, I think, was the first arena tour we did in in Europe back in like 2007 and 2008. Um, yeah, so th those were difficult tours. And I was, you know, all the time I was, I was watching the bands we were playing with and learning new things and learning new, new techniques and playing. Um, yeah, it was a, a fascinating time. So did you already back then had some kind of like warm up routine and, and how much has that actually changed through the years? Do you nowadays have a specific warm up routine that you follow before the shows? Not really. I, I went through a few years of doing very rigid warm up routine, but I found that it didn't seem to help me any more than just singing along to any music that's on. Um, so these days I actually don't really, you know, I do sort of like range warm ups, you know, you know, the typical yep. stuff like that um, and like breath work and things. But I don't really, I don't really do anything too technical in terms of my warm up. I find my biggest revelation with my voice is just being hydration and how important that is. Um, something that, I remember, um, so Chris, our, our bassist and, and other vocalists, he's had a lot of lot more problems with his voice than I have. I think I've been quite lucky. And uh, he saw a vocal coach at one point, and she said that one of the most important things is making sure you're hydrated the night before a show and how important that is to then keep the hydration throughout the day, but start the night before. And that's been super helpful. Um, so now, you know, I'm, I'm like, if it's a show day, I'm drinking four liters of water a day. I'm not drinking alcohol before the show. Um, and these things just make so much of a difference because normally, let's say four shows into a tour, my voice would be down to sort of 70%. Um, you know, still okay, but I wouldn't be, I, I would have to concentrate, you know, I wouldn't be able to just sing and everything would be fine. And I would just be able to live in the moment. Um, that would never happen. But now this, the tours we've done this year, because I haven't drunk any alcohol and because I've been drinking water, my, my voice has just stayed at 100%. And that's something that's never happened. So, you know, I'm still learning, still learning at the, as even when I'm in my mid thirties now. So are there like some foods or drinks that you wouldn't rather have before the show that you have felt, for example, that they affect your vocal cords somehow? I suppose anything that dries you out, you know, spicy food is not good. Uh, I'm not very good with spicy food anyway, so that's fine with me. Um, yeah, other than, um, I think some people say like, oh, drinking um, like spirits is better than drinking like beer or wine. I, I think alcohol just dries your throat out regardless. Maybe there are some um bit, some types of alcohol that are better than than others for that but um for me it seems to always do the same now that, that doesn't mean that i'm like never going to drink alcohol for a show like of course that's I, don't, I want to do that and i will um but i i will make sure that i'm piling water at the same time um there's also a the only throat coat that has worked for me um, you know, because like everyone seems to have like, oh, you should try this. Oh, you should try this. Is you know, honey, lemon, and ginger, turmeric, or you know, all these things. Like um, the only thing that's worked is this Chinese um, throat coat called, uh, uh, I think it's Nejiom Pepakoa, something like that. <laughs> okay. But yeah, that that's um, it's like a mixture of, I mean, it's honey, obviously but it has um, some other like herbs in it. And that is the only thing that like, you know, with just with one sip of that, your, your throat is more hydrated than it was. Um, and so that's been a real help. Um, for me. So obviously you have released a lot of albums with Enter Shikari. Uh, are there like some specific albums that you could pinpoint where you have taken a step 
forward as a vocalist learn something new about yourself for example when it comes to singing mm. um i think with every album really um i suppose the obvious one the first one that comes to mind is with the spark our album from 2015 um i really increased my range on that album so i was i think i it was usually what i find when i feel like i've progressed is it's usually because i've become more confident um and so i was becoming more confident with my voice and especially with lower range and falsetto higher range so you know there's there's notes on that album or the like whole verses where i'm singing in a much lower um range than i've ever sung before um and that's something that i loved you know i love the um the sort of style of the post punk um for instance like joy division where the the vocals are all quite low and quite understated like i i find that very beautiful um and even like some of bowie's stuff um and it, you know for instance if i was to do um karaoke my normal go to for karaoke would be sinatra so okay. i do so i like singing in that sort of more of a tenor range um So yeah, on the on the spark, I did a lot more of that, and then I did a lot more falsetto as well. So you know that I I was starting to normally falsetto had only been used as upper harmonies, but I was I was trying to make um, some of the melodies uh, falsetto, like the main melodies, um, and that was something yeah that took a lot lot of time to build up confidence to do. But you know you get more self assured with your your vocals as you as you go on and you practice and you learn things and. Yeah, just step by step, built up the confidence to include those techniques. So obviously, a kiss for the whole world will be released on April twenty first. So, are there like some specific things with vocals that you did like new things this time around? Uh, let me have a think. Uh, I think there's, you know, there's things like. What would you call it? Almost like arpeggio, arpeggios, or like you know, ascending ladders of notes that is quite bold for me. I think so. For instance, the melody, the opening melody, and please set me on fire. Please set me on fire. You know, a lot of these like ascending um, melodies, um, and again, a, a lot of falsetto, which is is something I would have never done like a, a few albums back. Um, then. There's like there's little moments of of inward like inhaling screaming, which I love. So in um, shit, what's the song? Oh, yeah, leap into the lightning. There's a moment of an inhale scream. Um, I like like putting little bits of that in there. Um, there's there's a bit more. Um, willing to manipulate vocals and process them so for instance our latest single bloodshot the hypnotized and so hypnotized it's um very processed um and for me that's also interesting because that song is all about how social media manipulates us and you know makes us angry about things that may not even be true <laughs> you know it, it kind of hypnotizes um and, and makes us more tribal and makes us hate each other and all these things so i thought it'd be interesting to therefore also make the vocal manipulate the vocal very heavily um so there's a lot of processing and, and production on the vocals on on this uh album so you have always been quite diverse with vocals like you have already described but there's like several different views within the songs so do you feel that like screaming and singing go hand in hand When you are becoming like a better screamer, you are also becoming a better clean vocalist. Um, I suppose so. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's the same instrument. You're just using it in a different way. Um, I think, especially when you start, you're basically learning the limit 
of your voice and what you can do. Um, and you're learning the different techniques, the way that you make sounds with your voice. Um, and it's a lot easier nowadays because, you know, people can learn how to sing all the ways you can sing just by watching YouTube tutorials. So it's like, of course, when I started, we didn't really have any of that. So it was much more just kind of experiment and fingers crossed and you won't destroy your, your voice. <laughs> so have you taken like any vocal lessons during your career? No. No, I, I never have done. Um, as I say, Chris, our, our bassist has, and he's like showed me some of the things he learned. But um, yeah, no, I, I haven't actually ever done it. So obviously when you started the band, you were like quite heavy with the debut album. So what were like your parents' reactions when they heard you screaming your lungs out for the first time? Um, I think my my dad has always been quite punk. I think he he like understood it. Um, and I think he could see, he understood the passion. Maybe he didn't understand the music, but he, under, he understood the intention. Um, you know, to express emotion and to connect with people. I think he understood that. My mum, you know, she was just like, oh, I don't like it when you scream. I like the the softer ones, you know. So uh, just <laughs> go, go and finish your school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anything that you would like, to, like any advice that you would like to give to a young vocalist who is just about to start the journey, anything that pop up, mm. pops up into your mind? Mm. Um, I mean, I would, yeah, I, I would love the the wealth of resources that people have now online. If I would have had that when I was younger, I'm sure I would have learned much quicker. I'm sure I wouldn't have got vocal nodules, uh, you know, and all, had all these issues and things. But um, so I would say yeah, just learn as much as you can about your voice if you want to do that naturally that's cool if you want to do that you know via tutorials or having lessons that's cool everyone's everyone learns in different ways don't they so um, yeah just experiment and find you know it, it can almost be a cliche like find your own voice like well what does that mean um, i think it's just about discovering what feels good what what feels genuine as well because when when we start out we are mimicking whether we know it or not subconsciously or consciously we are mimicking what we've heard so far and so it's working out where your voice fits and is your voice a mixture of all these persons voices it probably is um so it's yeah it's working out where you where you sit in a, in your influences But do you think that you would sound the same if you would have had all those tutorials? Or do you feel that you would sound pretty much like all the vocalists who are going through those tutorials and, and sort of learning well, the same sound? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm sure it would have it would have limited me because, you know, some of the tutorials as well are actually just wrong. You know, they'll tell you not to do something or that you must sing like this. When actually it is, it's just a muscle. You know, you can use it in lots of different ways. Now, yeah, there are ways you can damage the the muscle, but um, if you if you're protective of it and if you're in tune with it, you know, if you're like very conscious of how you feel when you're singing, then I think you'll you'll be, begin to have an intuitive understanding of what you're doing. Um, and yeah, I think some some people are perhaps will have been limited by by tutorials and things because. Um, they wouldn't have found out anything else about their, their own voice, their own way. So, hey, Ru, thanks a lot for taking the time to do the interview with me and, and all the best for the release of the upcoming album as well as for the future. Anything you want to say as a closer to all the Finnish fans? Ah, no, well, yeah, thank you so much for having me, man. Um, yeah, hopefully we get back to, to Finland this year. We're, we're booking all sorts of tours at the moment, so I'm sure we will. Um, But yeah, appreciate it. Thank you so much for the support. Thanks for doing this with me. Oh, good. My pleasure. And nice enjoy the next interviews. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care. Bye. Ciao.